Let's bow and pray as we approach God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you with great joy and gratitude for all that you have done for us through your son Jesus. We also come with fear and trembling, recognizing the great power and the great glory of your name. The creation, sin, death, the enemy, there's nothing and no one that can stand against you. And Lord, to think that you would use this power, you would wield this power not only for your own glory, but also in a way that brings salvation and good to us. It really blows us away. So Lord Jesus, we give you the glory and the honor that is due to your name. We rejoice in your victory today. We ask that as we rehearse the good news of your triumph, that our hearts would be filled with joy and gratitude, and that we would also be infused with courage, with confidence, that our faith would be deepened and strengthened as we consider who you are and all that you have done. Lord, as we assemble now and gather around your word, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would empower the preaching of your word, that you would bring about real change in people's hearts, change that brings us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What we are celebrating today in the resurrection is a historical reality. Jesus really did die over 2,000 years ago. And then he rose physically and literally from the dead. The resurrection happened. But it's not just a historical reality. The resurrection also presents to us a theological reality. The resurrection of Jesus is a central component of the gospel itself. It's the bedrock for our entire faith. If you're a Christian this morning, if you are someone who has believed in the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus is inseparable from that good news. Sort of like the the game Jenga with those little wooden blocks. If you pull out the resurrection from the Christian faith, the whole thing comes tumbling down. But I'd like to share with you this morning that the resurrection is more than a historical truth, and it is even more than a theological truth. It is also an immensely practical truth. To put it another way, the resurrection matters in history, and it matters for theology, but the resurrection also ought to touch your day-to-day life. Our text this morning comes at the end of this chapter, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. And in this chapter, what the Apostle Paul has been doing is really unpacking at length this doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what I love here is that the Apostle Paul is not content to simply define this doctrine. No, he wants more than that. He doesn't stop at simply explaining this doctrine, although he does at length. But Paul insists on fleshing out the implications of the resurrection of Jesus. You see, Paul is a preacher. And in his preaching of the resurrection, he reaches this crescendo where he urges his first readers and urges us today to embrace everything that he has said and to respond, to respond in obedience and faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Please look with me at verse 58. In light of all that Paul has said and written to this point about the resurrection of Jesus, he writes, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The point that this text makes this morning, and one that I want to make as well, is simply this. Christian endurance is energized by remembering the victory of Christ. Your perseverance, your endurance as a believer is energized, empowered, fueled by remembrance of the victory of Jesus. As we reflect on his victory today and his resurrection today, my hope and my prayer is that you will leave today encouraged, that you will leave this room today challenged, that you will leave this room more fully equipped to obey this command. 
to be steadfast and immovable and to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. You see, God wants you and he wants me to be the kind of person who's not only convinced of the truth of the resurrection, but the kind of person who, because of that truth, is changed. Whose life is shaped by the power of this story, this truth, this doctrine, that Jesus is alive. I want to share with you three points this morning. The first is a doctrinal proposition and then two practical exhortations. So number one, I want you to consider this doctrinal proposition, one that's made by this chapter. And it's very simply this. The resurrected Christ is victorious. The resurrected Christ is victorious. If you look at our text, there's one little word that this verse starts with. It says, therefore, therefore, my beloved brothers. This little word is a crucial link. It's a logical link, and it refers to everything that has come before this. It does refer immediately to verses 56 and 57 and and his specific point there. But I really think Paul is wrapping up his entire point in this chapter. So what I'd like to do is sort of preach this text backwards, to look at the sweeping arguments that the apostle has made, and then we can land with him in these stirring exhortations to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. So Paul has claimed, he has explained to us that the resurrected Christ is victorious. In what ways has Jesus been victorious? Well, let's flip back and look at this chapter. First of all, the resurrected Christ is victorious over sin. Jesus is victorious over sin. Look in verses 1 through 4. Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We know, hopefully you know, You've heard this before, that Jesus died, and he died for a reason. I was reminded this past week of the film that came out uh, in 2004, Mel Gibson's film on the Passion of the Christ. And that film does an amazing job of showing historically what happened to Jesus, what he went through. But that film really failed to explain why Jesus did that, why he suffered. We know why. The text tells us he died for our sins, Our sins have been nailed to the cross. It was at the cross as Jesus suffered, as he agonized, as he bled, and as he suffocated. There he made atonement. He paid the penalty for sin. So we know that Jesus' death was instrumental for our salvation, but also his resurrection was necessary for our salvation as well. Jesus not only died for our sins, but this good news of the gospel, this good news that announces to a salvation, also includes the fact, according to verse 4, that he was raised. Paul said elsewhere in Romans chapter 4, writing to another group of believers, that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So the resurrection of Jesus is instrumental In our salvation, Jesus is victorious over sin, and his resurrection is part and parcel of that. Paul will go on to argue in verses 17 through 20 that if Christ is not raised, then that means that we are still in our sins. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Verse 18, he continues, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But what's the conclusion? Verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. And what that means is that we are not still in our sins. What that means is that we are not to be pitied because we share in the victory of Christ, his victory over sin. At the end of this chapter in verse 56, he says the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have victory over sin through Christ. We are freed from its penalty as he dies on the cross. We are also set free from its power. We don't have to live under it any longer. And this truth is oh so comforting to those of us who know 
that we are sinners. Those of us who know the bitter taste of shame and, and the burden of guilt, the weight of knowing that we stand guilty before God. Victory over sin is found through Christ, the resurrected Christ. Christ has defeated sin, and his resurrection proves it. And this is really the only way to be free from sin. It's the only way that we can escape sin's penalty. It's Christ. And if you don't know Christ today, I'm here to tell you that the only way you can be forgiven, the only way that you can escape the condemnation and the judgment that your sin deserves is if you look to Christ. Paul says to these believers at the beginning of chapter 15 that this gospel he preached to them, this gospel in which they are standing, meaning that they are trusting in this message, they're resting in these promises. He says it's by this gospel, verse 2, that they are being saved. And there's no other way. Maybe your family drug you to church this morning and this isn't usually your thing. But let me tell you something, that Christ died for sinners, and you are one. We all are. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God offers you today salvation. If you will repent of your sin and trust in Christ, your sins can be nailed to the cross. And you can be given a new status before an almighty and holy God. Instead of being his enemy, instead of being unclean, instead of being guilty, he can pronounce you innocent. He can wash you. He can redeem you. But what is required is that you come to him, laying aside every other claim to your own righteousness, laying aside any other hope, laying aside even your own efforts to be a good person. You must come with open hands to the cross. Thanks be to God, Paul says, who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrected Christ is victorious over sin. We find salvation in him. But Paul also explains in this chapter that the resurrected Christ is victorious over his enemies. Look in verse 23. Speaking about the resurrection here, we're jumping into the midst of an argument. We'll actually start in verse 21. He says, For as by a man came death, referring to Adam and his fall in the garden, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he, speaking of Christ, is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. Why? So that God may be all in all. The point that Paul's making here is that the resurrected Christ will be victorious over all his enemies. You see, Jesus came the first time to put away sin, to defeat death, to break its power by rising from the dead. And Paul has already summarized that for us in verses 1 through 4. But then Paul says, listen, Jesus isn't done. And Paul begins to unpack what Jesus is going to accomplish at his second coming. He says that Christ will return. He speaks of the coming of Jesus and the, all of the events that are going to surround his coming. Christ has defeated sin, yes, but he's not done conquering. All of his enemies will be judged. All of them. He says in verse 24, every rule, every authority, and every power. And then he makes reference to Psalm 110. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. This is what God had promised to his Messiah. And this promise will not return void. Christ is going to rule and reign and judge his enemies. Political enemies, physical enemies, and spiritual enemies. They will all be put under his feet. And this includes, by the way, Satan himself. Satan means adversary. It means the one who comes against God. And those who belong to him, he's the enemy. 
And though at this moment we know that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, that's 1 Peter 5.8, although Satan is at this moment the prince of the power of the air who is at work in the sons of disobedience, that's what Ephesians 2 verse 2 says, although Satan at this very moment is still at loose as the God of this world who blinds the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the gospel. That's what 2 Corinthians 4.4 says. We know that one day Christ will end him. Revelation 20 tells us that at the end, Satan will raise an army to march against Jesus Christ himself, but he will be soundly defeated. Revelation 20 verse 9 says, They marched up over the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Paul tells the believers in Rome that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. Yes, Jesus broke the power of sin. He broke the power of death. He broke the power of Satan himself, loosing an army of captives and, and, who were slaves to sin, setting them free. But Jesus still has unfinished business, and he's going to return. It's only a matter of time. This comprehensive victory includes not only the defeat of Satan, but Paul tells us this amazing and wonderful good news that this victory includes even the last enemy, death itself. Verse 26, he says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death. As we sang this morning, death has been defeated. As Paul writes in verse 54 and 55, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting is gone. Christ has removed it. But the fact is, death still remains. It's still here. We all have loved ones who have died. And if Christ doesn't return, all of us will die. We are dying right now. The outer man is wasting away. It's still a feature of life in this world. Life in a world that has fallen. Life in a world that is broken because of sin. Life in a world that suffers under the curse. Death is still here. But the last enemy to be defeated, the one that will be defeated when Christ returns, is death itself. It will be fully destroyed, eradicated. And then, Paul says, everything, this great kingdom that he establishes, will be handed over to the Father. The Father grants this great victory to the Son, and then the Son delivers the kingdom to the Father. In verse 28, so that God may be all in all. That's how the story ends. Yes, Jesus broke the power of sin and death, but the war is still going on in a sense. There's still mop-up duty to be done. We know the outcome is secure because Jesus rose from the dead. That signifies and guarantees his victory. But there is more to come, and we know it will happen. And all things will be brought in subjection under his feet, and he'll hand it all over to the Father. As Romans 11 says, from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be honor and glory and power forever. We need to think about this final outcome. Because you and I still live life in a fallen world that, where, there's, where suffering is real and sin is real and death is real. We need to think about the victory of Christ. This is a doctrine to be believed. That Christ is victorious over sin, over his enemies, and over death itself. And he's coming to establish his kingdom and make all things new. The end of all things that Paul speaks of is really a new beginning, isn't it? It's a beginning. A beginning of a new age in which God's goodness and majesty will be enjoyed by his redeemed people in a renewed creation where the risen Christ reigns. Revelation 21.1, the apostle John sees this vision. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is 
is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, Jesus, the one who is risen from the grave, said, Behold, I am making all things new. The risen Christ is victorious. And his resurrection is simply the first fruits of what's to come. It's a preview of what is going to happen to all who believe our bodies made new and resurrected to eternal life. And the creation itself renewed, experiencing its own sort of resurrection, if you will. The resurrected king is coming back. Evil has an expiration date. Death will end. And the glorious kingdom will be established. And God will be all in all. This is the doctrinal proposition of 1 Corinthians 15. That the resurrected Christ is victorious. But then Paul brings us to the implications of this victory for our lives. So we've looked at this doctrinal proposition, but now I want to look at two practical exhortations. And the first is this. The victory of Christ, this truth that we've rehearsed, it calls for firmness of faith. It calls for firmness of faith. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Be steadfast and immovable. Here's the logic here. Since Jesus is victorious, since he is true, since his resurrection is a reality, since the victory is certain, then it follows that we who believe in Christ, those of us who follow him, we must stand firm in believing these things. And we must be confident in his victory We must not back down. We must not lose heart. We cannot abandon our hope. The resurrected Christ calls for firmness of faith. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Be immovable. To be steadfast means hold your ground. Remain in the fight. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and do not waver. To be immovable here, he's not giving us a second command. This is really a further description of what he's trying to say. To be immovable means not being pushed off of your spot. To not drift away. And what this implies, friends, the reason why Paul has to tell us this is because there are forces that are trying to move you. There are real threats to your faith. There's pressures that will cause you to drift if you do not keep your eyes focused on the resurrected Christ. In what ways might, be, might we be tempted to maybe not be firm in our faith? How, how might we fail to be steadfast and immovable? Well, first of all, there's always the danger of doctrinal compromise. And we can see this even in the opening words of this chapter. He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Notice this phrase. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Paul says, listen, I preached to you this message, and it's a message that I didn't come up with. This is something I received. I preached it to you. You believed it. And this message saves. But if you abandon this message... If you walk away from the claim that Christ is the Son of God who died for sins and rose again, then it shows that you have believed in vain. It shows that that confession you made, the profession of your faith, was empty in the first place. There is a real danger of doctrinal compromise. We can either lose the content of the gospel and compromise the truth of it, or we can lose our confidence in the gospel. And not think that it's really enough. Paul warns us against both. He says, be steadfast, immovable. There's a danger of doctrinal compromise. If you read this chapter in full, which many of you have this week, you'll know that Paul defends the doctrinal necessity of the resurrection. That's verses 14 through 19. He says, listen, if Jesus is not raised, the whole thing comes apart. We have to retain these essential truth claims about what Jesus has done. 
And he also warns us against bad arguments. And he even warns us against the people who promote these bad arguments. Those who claim Jesus did not rise from the dead. Sometimes we don't like confrontational language. But look what Paul says in verse 33. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He says, listen, wake up. Don't listen to those people who are trying to tell you that Jesus has not risen from the grave. Don't listen to those people who claim that there's not a physical resurrection coming. They don't know what they're talking about. And if you give them influence in your life, it will corrupt you. Paul says, listen, we have to be steadfast and immovable. He warns us against bad arguments and the people who promote them. Jesus has risen. The gospel is true, and it is the only way to salvation. And we have to hold fast in believing that, in maintaining that. We must say no to doctrinal deviation and remain firm in the truth, relentlessly committed to the bedrock truth of the gospel. And friends, this is going to be especially important as the world around us grows increasingly hostile to the gospel. Our society is becoming increasingly hateful towards biblical Christianity. Try telling someone that they're a sinner, that God does not affirm them in all of their desires, and that they must repent and take up their cross to follow Jesus. You will not be making friends and influencing people if you choose to communicate that message. The world is not very receptive to the gospel. And already we are being told as believers that we're on the wrong side of history. But 1 Corinthians 15 tells us otherwise. We know that's not true. We know how history is going to unfold. We know what's going to happen at the end. Christ is coming back to establish his kingdom and put all his enemies under his feet. And that means that those who believe in him, those who follow Christ, are on the right side of history. So friends, don't be intimidated by the world. Don't get bullied into silence. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't let the culture tell you that progress means we have to silence or minimize certain uncomfortable biblical truths. No. Therefore, my beloved brothers, because of who Jesus is, because of what he's done, be steadfast and immovable. Because there's a real danger of doctrinal compromise. But there's a second danger. One that perhaps is even more threatening to those of us here in this room. There's also the danger of discouraging circumstances. Death. Loss. Real suffering. We face those things. They affect us. If we are going to endure and remain steadfast and immovable. We need an eternal perspective. We need a resurrection mentality. We need to be able to say like Paul does in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, that we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen. Get that, church. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're temporary. It's going to go away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. We all face discouraging circumstances. Failure, loss, pain, suffering, rejection. But we have been equipped by God to face those kinds of trials. We have the resources we need to to endure the circumstances of life that threaten to discourage us and lead us into despair. We have hope in Christ. We have a way through 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's our hope. Our hope is that things will get better, not necessarily in this life. In fact, things may get worse. In fact, 
Jesus' life got worse, didn't it? It ended with suffering and mockery, humiliation and death. And Jesus says, if you follow me, don't be surprised if they treat you the way they treated me. We are among those who stand fully ready to lose everything in this world because we have something greater to gain. Paul says, I count everything else as rubbish for the sake of gaining Christ. To live is Christ. Death for us is gain. Perhaps some of you are feeling today the burden of life in this world. There's a lot of happy songs and loud singing and joy today, but maybe you feel kind of alone in the sense that you're not you're not maybe feeling that today. You're dealing with grief. You're dealing with guilt. You're dealing with some sort of discouraging circumstance. Perhaps you're in a difficult marriage. Perhaps you have an estranged child. Perhaps you go to work every day at a job you hate. You deal with chronic illness or pain. I want you to hear the word of God to you this morning. In light of who Jesus is and in light of all he has done, in light of his victory over sin and death and the enemy, stand firm. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Christ and his victory is your hope. And because that is true, you can endure. The victory of Christ energizes and empowers Christian perseverance. I think for some of you, it might be some of the things that are going on in the world around you that maybe has you shaken. It's the things you see in the news, the encroaching totalitarianism, the diminishing freedom of speech and freedom of religion, the economic crisis that seems to always be looming on the horizon. Maybe it's the rapid decay of the moral sanity of this world we live in. I mean, it seems like everyone's claiming that up is down and right is wrong. And it seems like our culture today is demanding, just like King Nebuchadnezzar of old, that when their music plays, you must bow. Some of you feel that. But listen to what Scripture says. I love Psalm 112, verse 6. It says, For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. The one who is righteous, the one who has been made righteous in Christ, the one who is united with him through faith, need not be afraid of bad news. Our heart is to be firm. Our heart is to be steady. We are not to be afraid, not because there's not adversaries, there are, but because we know that one day we will look in triumph on our adversaries. Does Psalm 112 describe you? Are you someone who's not afraid of bad news because your heart is firm and you know that you will look in victory and triumph over the adversaries? Our confidence is not in ourselves. It's in Christ. We know that all these adversaries will be put under his feet. That's why we need not be afraid. That's why we can trust. I think too many believers today are sort of like those soldiers in ancient Israel. They're arrayed for battle, but they're trembling because this giant named Goliath has come out and is threatening them and mocking them and insulting them. And they're intimidated, hearing all the curses and the taunts. But what did David say? I love this. It's some Old Testament trash talk. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We need more of that in our church. We need more of that kind of confidence. We stand with Jesus Christ, the greater son of David. He is our captain, so we can say no to fear, not because we are invincible. Again, we may suffer loss. We will be despised and rejected like Christ, perhaps even put to death like him. But our hope is rooted in resurrection. And like Jesus, we will rise. And with Jesus, we will reign. That's why Hebrews 13.6 says, We can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? That's to be our attitude. That's the mentality of someone who sees the resurrected Christ and believes it. So if you find yourself in need of strength today, if you want to be immovable, if you want to not be swayed and not move away from the hope of the gospel, then you need to be confident in the victory of Jesus. Jesus. 
You need to believe with all your heart that he is risen, that he will raise us to newness of life, that he will return, that he will establish his kingdom, that he will destroy the enemy, and he will bring his plan to completion. Because Christ is victorious, we can be steadfast and immovable, and we must. We must. There's a second practical exhortation. Not only does the resurrected Christ call for firmness of faith, he also calls for faithful labor. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, Paul connects the truth of Christ's victory, not just to our head, and not even just to our heart, but also to our hands. He connects this truth to our labor, to our labor. And he says that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In vain means empty, wasted, meaningless. He says your labors, the way that you serve Christ, it matters. And it's worth it. It will bear fruit. As C.K. Barrett so many years ago commented, since their labor is done in the Lord, it can no more perish than he. You ask, what is this labor that Paul calls us to? It is very simply the proclamation of this truth. It is, it is the effort, our labors, our efforts to see sinners saved through faith in Christ and to see believers built up in their faith. This labor encapsulates our evangelism, the time you spend in prayer with that struggling believer. It's the serving in the church behind the scenes that no one sees. It's, it's that phone call you make to encourage someone who is weary. It's pouring over the truth of Scripture to grow in your faith. And it's proclaiming the truth of Scripture in a world of lies and falsehood. Paul says that we ought to be always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Notice who's to be doing this labor, by the way. He says, therefore, who's he talking to here? My beloved brothers, those who have received and believed in the gospel. That's who this command applies to. And here's what that means. It's not just reserved for pastors. It's not reserved for those who are in full-time ministry. It's not even reserved for exceptionally gifted members of the body. Everyone who's a brother, a sister, a part of the family of God, everyone has a part to play. And notice the nature of this labor. It is the work of the Lord. We're not laboring for our own kingdom. We're laboring for his. We're not, we're not trying to advance our reputation. We're trying to spread the fame of his name. We're not trying to secure comfort in this life for ourselves. We labor to secure eternal reward in the age to come. That's the labor Paul's talking about. And look at the level of devotion we're to give to this. He says we're to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Abounding. Does that describe you? Abound means to overflow. This is a super abundance. Paul knows nothing of casual investment for the kingdom of God. Scripture calls us to total commitment to Christ and the investment of our whole selves in the mission that he has given us. Therefore, because of who Jesus is, because of what he's done, because of what he is coming back to do, we ought to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Look at the timing of this. Always. We are always to be about this labor. What this means is that laboring for the Lord is not just a weekend activity. It's not something we do only when we feel really good about ourselves spiritually and feel like we have something to offer. It's not something we do only when it seems to be working. It's not something we do only when we think people will be receptive. It's not something we do only when we are convinced it is safe to do so. We do it always. Always. And the Greek word there for always means always. It's very clear. You don't have to be a scholar. What that means, if we're to be doing this always, and if it applies to everyone, it means you're not too young to serve the Lord. Kids. Even the little kids, you're not too young to serve Christ. And to those who are older kids with the gray hair and the no hair, you're not too old. You never retire from laboring for Christ. 
to the middle-aged ones, you're not too busy. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is the one great task to which we must be devoting ourselves And we are to engage in this labor, Paul says, knowing that it's not in vain. Our labor is anchored in the truth that Paul's been preaching. Christ is risen. Christ will return. And the implication of that is that when he returns, he's bringing his reward with him. Revelation 22.12 says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. There is a reward We do not labor to earn salvation. Christ has purchased that with his blood. But our labors do stand to earn a reward. There is blessing coming. It will be worth it. That's why Jesus says, don't don't spend your life trying to accumulate treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. There is a future reward. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season... We will reap if we do not give up. Why does Paul have to tell us this? Why does he have to tell us and remind us that our labor is not in vain? Because there's a real danger for Christians. And many of us know this firsthand. There's a real danger in growing weary, growing tired, wondering if it's really worth it to spend our lives for Christ. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you've had those moments in your life where you feel like no matter how much I do, no matter how hard I try, it's just no use. That lost neighbor still hasn't accepted Christ. That young believer I've been trying to mentor, they're still struggling with the same sin. That strained relationship that I've been trying to reconcile, it still seems hopelessly difficult. And so what happens? We're tempted to give up to lose heart. But Paul reminds us that there is a future rest from our labor and a future reward that is coming. Your labor is not in vain. And this is meant to energize us, to empower us to keep going. Hebrews 10.35 says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Paul assures us that our labor is not in vain. God sees it. Christian, he sees your labor. God values it. It is precious to him. He takes note. And despite what you may see, despite what it looks like on the outside, God actually does use our labors to move his plan forward. And God will reward us on the last day. Christian endurance is energized by remembering the victory of Christ. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is alive? Do you believe that he is risen? That he has defeated sin? That he's going to return to conquer his enemies and even destroy death? Do you believe in the rest and the reward that is coming? Then let's remain steadfast, immovable. And devote ourselves that we might be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we know, we know that our labor is not in vain. Heavenly Father, as we consider these truths that you have laid out for us in Scripture. Lord, we praise you. We give you glory. We think about the complete and total victory that that you have secured through your son, Jesus Christ. The power of sin and death and the enemy has been shattered. The tomb is empty. And Lord, we thank you that you share this victory with us. All who believe in Christ partake in this victory. It is ours through faith. We thank you for that. We are so blessed to belong to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make us steadfast that you would empower us to be immovable. Give us courage. Give us confidence. Not an arrogant, fleshly confidence in our own strength, but a spiritually dependent, biblically shaped, Christ-centered confidence. Give us that confidence in the face of opposition. Give us that confidence even in the face of our own doubts. Cause us, by the power of your Spirit, to, 
to believe and to always abound in the work you've given us to do. Lord, we've seen your will for us today. This is who you want us to be. But you've not given us this command as a, as a naked instruction that stands all by itself with no support. You've also revealed to us, you've opened our eyes to see the glory of the gospel. That Christ died for sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. And that on the third day he rose again. This is our hope. Our living hope. So, Lord, for all who know you today, I pray that you would strengthen our faith and strengthen our hope in Christ. Give us a resurrection mentality, that we would have an outlook on all of life, on all the world, on everything we face that is shaped by these truths, that they would always be before us. And, Lord, for some who may not have this faith, who may not have this confidence, who have not experienced the power of the resurrection, I pray that today they would turn from sin and trust in Christ, and believe in your promise, and be saved. We pray, Lord, that you would receive all the glory today, for you are worthy. You are worthy to receive glory, and wisdom, and honor, and power. So we magnify your name, and we rejoice not in our strength, but in yours. We long for not our reputation to spread, but for your fame to go throughout all the earth. And Lord, we humbly offer ourselves to you as your servants. Use us to accomplish your will. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.